So I will talk about so some models for ductile fracture. Um, obviously, in 45 minutes, it will be just an introduction. Uh, okay, so uh, I put also the presentation on the website, so you can have a look at it. And I will try to save some time at the end uh, for some questions. So, but if you have any questions during the presentation, you can ask. But you can also put your question in the chat so that after I can, we can have a look at all the questions and I will try to answer. So let's start with some um, examples. So what is ductility? So if we took the like definition from the dictionary, ductility is simply the ability of a material to have its shape changed without losing strength or working. Uh, you can also find some other uh, definitions saying that if you take a material and you pull on it, you will have uh, um, like a reduction of section when you are doing that. So this is like a, a definition of ductility. But maybe we can have a look first at some uh, examples. So we will have a look at very simple tensile test on a, a, a austenitic stainless steel which is known uh, to be very ductile, but we will see what is ductility. So in, uh, in the three examples that I will show you, this is the same material, but different conditions. So let's take uh, one austenitic stainless steel in a as receive condition. So this is the material used to do uh, like a knife and fork. And uh, we do a tensile test at room temperature. So here in the middle, you have the force versus a displacement curve, so a tensile, nominal tensile curve. Uh, so at the beginning, at point A, you will have yielding. And after, you will have elongation of your tensile sample up to the point B. Uh, in this part between A and B, you have just homogeneous deformation. And after, between B and C, you will have necking, so localized deformation. And at the end, you will have so uh, fracture of your specimen. So this is like a ductile tensile curve because you can have a lot of uh, deformation on your, of your sample. But we can also have a look at the um, fracture surface so on the left. And if you look at the fra fracture surface, what, what we can see is a, a lot of dimples. And so you have a lot of deformation, uh, like at the microscopic scale. So this is an example of ductile tensile curve and ductile uh, fracture surface. So let's have a look at another condition. So as I'm working in the, like, uh, close to the nuclear industry, uh, let's take an example from the nuclear uh, materials. So this is the same. Uh, sorry, Jeremy, uh, you have switched off your microphone. Is that working? Is that working now? Yes, it's working. Yes, OK, thank you. So let's continue. I'm on slide uh, three. Um, let's look at a tensile test on a stainless steel we try from nuclear reactor. So this is a different, same material, but different condition. And uh, this time, the stress strain curve is a little bit different. So same at the beginning, yielding between at point A. And between A and B, I will have a uniform uh, homogeneous elongation of a sample. And then uh, hardening again and failure with no necking. So this is, again, a ductile tensile curve. Uh, but if we look at the, this time at the fracture surface, it will be a fully intergranular, so fully brittle-like uh, fracture surface. So very different at the microscopic scale. And a third example, so this is the same material, but we tried from another nuclear reactor, and this time tested at very high temperature. Uh, and if we look at the stress strain curve this time, we just have elasticity. And the, the specimen will break just uh, after just at the yielding, or maybe, uh, maybe before. So in this case, we have a, like, a brittle-like tensile curve. But if we look at the ductile, at uh, the fracture surface, uh, this time, the fracture surface is uh, like ductile because we can see many dimples, so many deformation at a local scale. So after reviewing all these examples, 
what we can see is that we have uh, we need to look at the scale at which at which we are looking at, and ductility uh, will depend on the scale at which uh, deformation will happen. So in this uh, in this table, I put all the, the examples like a brittle or ductile at the macroscopic scale on the tensile curve and ductile or brittle at the microscopic uh, fractographic scale. Uh, so I don't I don't put any example of brittle my mic microscopic brittle and macroscopic brittle case because we we are this is a presentation about drug type failure, uh, but just uh, in the following I will consider models for ductile fracture at the microscopic scale, uh, but you have to keep in mind that that even if you even with this kind of fracture you can have brittle like behavior if you do just a tensile test it can happen. Okay, so even if we restrict ourselves to uh, ductile fracture at the local scale, we can we can have many different uh, kind of failure, uh, of duct duct ductile failure. Uh, maybe we can have a look. So here you have a kind of taxonomy proposed by some authors to try to categorize uh, different examples of ductile failure. Uh, at the at the bottom on the right, you can we can have a look. At the case necking to a point, for example. So this is the case where you have uh, mainly you take a pure metal with no inclusion inside. This is a very pure, like gold or copper, and you will do a tensile test on it, and you will pull, pull, and at the end you will have failure because you don't have any more section, any more surface. Uh, this is a, this can happen, and this is ductile failure uh, because you have a lot of deformation. But today. Uh, I will talk only about void-related ductile fracture. So only the, the, the example at the top of this uh, taxonomy. Uh, so ductile fracture involving some voids in the material. Uh, Jeremy, could yes. you hide? Could you hide the the, the bar? I can. Yeah, there That's is okay. A bar. Yeah. It's so okay. Now? Okay. Yeah. So only void related ductile fracture uh, today, but just having keep in mind that you can have many of a kind of uh, ductile fracture, and necking to a point is a, is another common uh, ductile fracture scenario. C'est moi, euh, pardon, ça doit c'est tu vous, vous m'entendez c'est Jacques là? Parce que je suis sur deux là je fais deux deux machins en même temps. Hein. Ok, bah alors coupe ton micro. <rire> oui, oui 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 effectivement. Ah ben ça fait ça fait trois quarts d'heure que j'essaie de me le enfin un quart d'heure que j'essaie de me loguer là d'accord je coupe tu es en train de présenter là oui oui ah commencé. pardon tu avais de commencer parce que c'est ça semblait pas marcher excuse moi c'est ok Jacques donc euh, l'idée c'est de valoriser des données qui sont de plus en plus nombreuses Jacques we can hear something behind you on va coupler thank you um, so we will we will talk about ductile fractures through void nucleation, growth, and coalescence. Uh, but first, we can have a look at the physical mechanism uh, involved, uh, and we can have a look at ex some experimental observation. So these are very like the early uh, experimental observation of this kind of fracture mechanism, uh, in the uh, starting in the 50s. So uh, for the void nucleation on this picture, so. This is a picture of a material deformed, and after people do like a polishing on the surface to try to see uh, the mechanisms of fracture. So in the middle, you, you have something in gray, which is an inclusion. Uh, around this inclusion, you have something in, in white, which is the material, the matrix material, and you have also something in black, which is a void. So uh, pulling on the specimen, you have a void that was nucleated uh, because of a debounding of the, of the inclusion matrix interface. So we can have a look now at void growth. So imagine that you have a void uh, in your material and you pull on it. Uh, because of plastic flow, the, the void can grow. And this is an example uh, of void growth just by plasticity. Uh, here, this is an example where, where you have uh, like an isolated void. But if you have many voids uh, and very, very uh, large voids, you can also have void coalescence. So basically, two, two adjacent voids will, uh, will start to have interaction and coalesce. And this is a, a phase which is called the void coalescence. And these three uh, mechanisms, so nucleation, growth, 
and coalescence will lead to the fracture surface that we can observe uh, at the bottom, uh, where we can see dimples. And in the middle of dimples, you can also see the, some inclusions. So these are the traces of uh, nucleation growth and coalescence of voids. So just keep in mind that, that uh, in the following the, the models that were developed in the 60s and 70s were based basically on these observations. But of course, now we have uh, more uh, advanced uh, characterization tool. And this is like a modern view of uh, ductal fractures for nuclear void growth and coalescence. Uh, so in this, you can see, so this is Higgs Y tomography uh, experiments. Uh, in front of a quack tip. So the, the quack tip is in purple. And uh, when you pull on, on this, you can uh, see voids. So this is in red in front of the quack tip that will uh, be created, uh, that will grow and finally coalesce. And uh, the, the quack will, will advance because of that mechanism. Uh, saying that, just to say that, so void related ductal fracture. Uh, if we want to, to, to model void-related ductal fracture, we need to model porous material, and that will be uh, the next step. But before trying to do uh, modeling of porous material, we can gain some insights from porous unit cell numerical simulation. So uh, basically, you do a finite element simulation. Uh, you do something simple, so like a periodic arrangement of uh, spherical voids, you, you say, okay, the matrix material is just von Mises plasticity uh, for the material, uh, for the sound material. Uh, let's take some finite strain settings to see the void evo shape evolution and uh, like axisymmetric loading condition, which is basically uh, the loading conditions that will happen uh, like you're doing a tensile test. And we are doing this to assess two things. Uh, the first thing is the local deformation mechanisms. Uh, there may be uh, multiple mechanisms and also some volume average stresses strains. And we will have a look at uh, some such kind of simulation. So this is the opposite. So let's look at the, the result of the simulation. So this is the initial, initial um, state. We have a void and we will pull on it. And the principal direction where we pull is the X direction. And now we will have a look at the movie. So basically, the, the, the unit cell will deform, uh, the shape will change, and also we'll, you will see uh, that the void will grow. At, at the beginning, what we can see is that we have also strain in the transverse direction, at, and at some point, uh, the transverse direction will, will stop uh, straining, and you will have only uniaxial straining condition. Uh, we can have a look at more detail uh, about the macroscopic volume average stress strain evolution. So if you look at the, um, the plot, uh, the, the upper plot, so this is the stress as a function of stress, stress as a function of strain, this is volume average over the, the, the entire unit cell. So at the beginning, you have uh, like uh, hardening, uh, and this is, this is a global hardening because you have local hardening of the material around the void. And after you will have a very strong softening behavior, and this softening is related to uh, the increase of porosity. So we can see at the end of the simulation that the, the, the void volume fraction is very large compared to the beginning of the simulation. Uh, there is another thing which is interesting in such kind of simulation is the macroscop macroscopic deformation mechanism. So at the beginning, this is like we can look at the, the, the plot at the bottom. Um, here we, we are looking at the transverse uh, strain or deformation gradient as a function of the actual stress, uh, strain uh, or deformation gradient. So at the beginning, you are pulling uh, mainly along the x direction, but you, you will have also st uh, strain rate or strain along the other two direction. And I will call this regime like void growth regime uh, because there is no restriction about what can happen on the other direction of a unit cell. And at some point, you will have only uniaxial straining condition uh, that will appear. And I will call this in the following void coalescence regime. And clearly, we have to typically, this is, we can have a look again at the simulation, but we can clearly see the two different um, mechanisms. So this is void growth. And at some point, we will have void coalescence. And 
just uh, to mention that when you have void coalescence, everything will happen uh, in the region uh, in between two voids. So just don't forget that you have periodicity here. OK, so once we have uh, seen these uh, examples, we can say that uh, let's put apart nucleation for the moment. Uh, void related ductile factor is just or simply, and we can debate on what is just or simply, a plasticity problem, a plastic flow problem. So the first obvious option to model uh, such kind of ductile factor is just to model all voids explicitly. So here you have uh, an example on the picture, like a very recent simulation. You put many voids on a unit cell and you do a finite element simulation and it will work. And you will have void growth, void coalescence. You will have failure of your, of your cell. And up to now, it's possible for like, let's say, a small number of voids, typically, I don't know, tens or, or hundreds. But it's not yet possible for large structure. Uh, to do to do that to do to, to model all voids explicitly, so we need uh, to go to the second option, which is to do the homogenization of porous materials, uh, in order to to get some constitutive equations uh, that will account for the voids, and uh, usable for to simulate large uh, structures or components uh, for industrial application. So what is the methodology that we can use to do the homogenization of porous material? Um, let's take uh, a representative volume element. Uh, so an element with some voids inside. And we will apply some uh, stress. And we want to assess uh, the macroscopic volume average behavior of this uh, porous uh, unit cell. And we want to do so, and we want to get uh, different things. We want to get like an homogenized yield criterion. Uh, and the basic question is how to extend von Mises yield criterion to uh, such porous uh, unit cell. And we need also some evolution laws, because if we have a yield criterion, we, we also need like a plastic flow rule. Uh, and if we are adding some internal variable to describe the voids, we will need also evolution laws uh, for these uh, new internal variables. And we need to do that uh, in both regimes, so for growth, where you have basically no interaction between voids, and but also for, for coalescence, uh, where you will have some interaction between voids. But before doing that, uh, we can ask ourselves, what are we, the relevant parameters to describe porous metal alloys? So we do have geometrical parameters. So if you, if you define a, a representative volume element, you will have uh, some length scale of this representative volume element. Uh, obviously, you have uh, the void dimensions, uh, dif different ra radii, uh, but you can consider spherical voids or spheroidal or ellipsoidal voids or whatever you want. Uh, you have also void number inside, inside your unit cell and, and maybe others. Uh, you have also the mechanical parameters uh, that will be important. So the applied stress and the properties of uh, the sound material like the local yield stress, uh, local hardening rate, and things like that. Uh, but you have also, if you go down to very small voids, and here you have an example of um, some very small voids with some kind of EBSD data to, to look at uh, some fine scale uh, characterization. You can have a uh, grain size that will matter at some point. You can, you can think of dislocation density that could matter at some point also. So here we have a, a list of parameters that can be relevant. So we can uh, construct uh, some dimensionless parameters uh, to describe porous metal alloys. So the first obvious one is the pro what I will call the porosity in the following. So this is uh, basically the void volume fraction. So uh, the volume of the voids uh, divided by the total volume of your units of your cell, of your representative volume element. And I will call this F in the following. Uh, you have also the, the loading condition. And so we, we can uh, describe the loading condition by like principal stresses normalized by, by the local yield stress. Uh, void aspect ratio may matter at some points. So you will have this parameter W, which is the, the ratio of different uh, radius of the voids. Uh, also void distribution. Uh, so basically the distance uh, between voids. So the radius over the, uh, 
the size of your unit cell, uh, and also void size, uh, but dimensionless void size, so void weight just divided by some material length scale. So, uh, for example, uh, by the grain size or, or, or length related to this location density. And also, the matrix anisotropy around the voids uh, may be important. And I'm sure you can find also some other parameters. Okay, so let's look at, uh, the, I think, the most simple uh, case, the most simple uh, unit cell for a porous material. We will consider uh, like just a cylindrical void in a cylindrical unit cell. So uh, the void has a radius A and the unit cell has a radius B. So the porosity is A over B uh, square. And we will ask a, a, a not so simple question. In fact, this is a simple question, but the answer is not so simple, which is what is the yield criterion of this porous unit cell? So uh, we will make some assumption, assumption for, the, for the local uh, behavior. We will consider von Mises plasticity uh, for the material around the void. Uh, so here you have a local yield, uh, von Mises yield criterion. Uh, we will consider uh, like associated plastic flows for normality and we will not consider so no elasticity in this problem uh, for simplicity and no hardening so this is perfect plasticity so if we consider no elasticity uh, we can talk anymore about displacement but we can talk about velocity because when we it will start to, to to flow it will it will just like it like a liquid so it will be just a plastic flow so uh, the, um, the boundary conditions that we will consider is like homogeneous strain weight loading condition where we'll apply the display, um, a velocity field at the boundary that will be defined this way. So with a, a macroscopic strain tensor D uh, that will be our loading condition. And the question that we're asking is what is the macroscopic volume average stress tensor that will be associated to uh, capital D? And so the, defini the definition of this uh, stress, macroscopic stress tensor will be uh, simply the volume average of the local uh, Cauchy stress. So for this particular case, we have a fully analytic uh, solution which is available. So we will have a look uh, quickly at this uh, solution. So if we are looking at the local strain weight and velocity field, uh, we can in fact, because of symmetries and invariances of the local uh, of, of this problem, we can we can have um, an expression for this uh, local strain weight uh, d. Uh, basically, you will have a, a radial velocity and an actual velocity uh, with uh, only a dependence on the on the radial direction for the radial velocity and uh, on the actual velocity only about z. Uh, then we can move forward by using the fact that uh, as we have no uh, Elasticity, just plasticity, just from this plasticity, we will use uh, plastic incompressibility. Uh, and this simple argument, uh, we will be able to end up with um, the, ex the expression uh, for the velocity field. And here we have two unknowns, A and B. And at the end, we will be able to, to relate A and B to the macroscopic uh, strain tensor, uh, capital D. So we are almost all the kinematics of this problem. We can also compute the plastic multipliers, lambda. So if we use the flow rule, we know D. We know uh, the derivative of the yield criterion uh, with respect to the stress. So we can uh, compute uh, what I call dot lambda. That we will that we'll, we'll need to, to do the, the computation after. So now let's look. So we have a full solution for the strain weight and velocity field with only two unknown, uh, unknowns. So now we can look at local and, and macroscopic stresses. Um, so regarding, if we want to compute the local stress field, we just have to use, as we have no elasticity, we just have a plastic flow rule that relates the stress deviator to uh, the local strain weight. So this is the first equation on this slide. So now uh, we are not interesting uh, in the local stresses, we are interesting in the macroscopic stress components. So at the scale of the unit cell, uh, through uh, like volume averaging. So we can do two different uh, computations. The first one is that we want to compute the difference between the, the actual stress and uh, the stress along one uh, in the plane. Uh, 
So uh, sigma ZZ minus sigma XX. And so here we will use uh, different arguments to, to, to perform this computation. Uh, the first one is that this difference is just related to the macroscopic stress deviator uh, SZZ. Then we will use the fact that we are doing volume average quantities. Uh, the next step is to use just the flow rule that will relate the stress deviator to uh, the local strain rate. And we end up with computing uh, this integral. And in fact, it's possible to have an analytical solution, which is this one, just here, that will involve uh, the local yield stress sigma uh, zero and uh, the porosity f and a parameter which is t, which is the, basically the ratio uh, of the two unknowns a and b. This is not so important at this point. And we can do another, uh, another um, computation, which is to try to compute uh, the stress sigma xx. And here we will use the fact that we will say that the sigma xx, like the macroscopic stress, will be in fact the local stress at the boundary. And if we say that, we can go on with, with the calculus and we can use two things. So the boundary condition, so no stress in the void, no radial stress in the void, and equilibrium condition uh, in cylindrical coordinates. And then again, we will use the definition of the stress deviators, we will use the flow rule, and we will end up with another um, expression for sigma xx that will also involve the parameter t and the porosity f. So at this, at this point, we can move forward and to have a, a summary of this analytical solution, uh, we have two expressions for the two, two formulas for the stress tensor that will give uh, the difference between sigma zz and sigma xx and also sigma xx as a function of the parameter t and the porosity f. But in fact, we can remove uh, this parameter t to get just one single expression. And we will end up with the expression in, in the middle of this slide, which is basically a yield condition that will relate the component of a macroscopic stress tensor in a single expression. And it's very close to, it looks like a von Mises quite term, but a little bit more complicated. So here we can do a last thing, which is to express this yield condition as a function of equivalent von Mises stress and also mean stress that will be important in the following, like the hydrostatic component of a stress tensor sigma m, and we will end up with the yield condition uh, at the end of this slide. Okay, so now we have everything for the st macroscopic stress tensor, so we can have a look at the uh, strain tensor. So if we are look, if we, so we have the expression of a velocity field, so if we have the, the expression of a velocity field, we can express uh, this expression at the boundary, and if we do that, we can relate uh, the loading condition, the, the, the D tensor, to the, to the unknowns A and B. So we have uh, the relation between DXX and DZZ as a function of A and B. So this is, uh, so in fact, we don't have any more unknowns in our problem. It's completely solved. And now we can do one thing, which is to try to compute the derivatives of this macroscopic yield function that I defined before uh, f, with respect to the, to the two components of a stress tensor. And if we do that, this is just a simple analytical computation, and we, I, I will compute uh, more specifically the ratio between, between these two derivatives. And if we do that, we end up with this uh, very simple result which is to say that, in fact, normality rule is conserved at the macroscopic scale. So at the local scale, we have uh, normality uh, to define plastic flow, and this property will be uh, kept at the macroscopic scale, which is important uh, in the following. So now we, have, we can analyze a little bit more of this analytical solution. So here you have uh, the final expressions that we get. So it depends, so this is a yield condition. Uh, so, so plastic flow will, uh, will happen when uh, this expression is equal to zero. It will depend on the local yield stress. It will depend on the macroscopic uh, von Mises stress, on the mean stress, and also on porosity. So if you do, uh, if you take uh, zero porosity, so no void, in fact, you rec uh, von Mises criterion is just recovered. 
So that makes sense. If you don't put any void, you just have uh, the local behavior. So now more interesting is that if you uh, consider a void, so f is different, uh, is not equal to zero, uh, the higher the porosity, the lower the stresses you will need to put for yield. And in fact, uh, it's usual to look at this uh, yield function in the plane mean stress, equivalent stress. So this is the, this plot here. So uh, plastic, you will have plastic flow in your own one of this curve. So if you have no void, you will have plasticity one, the equivalent stress is equal to sigma zero. But if the uh, uh, porosity is not equal to zero, uh, you will yield before. So when you will hit uh, one of these curves. And as porosity uh, increases, this uh, like uh, yield surface will be closer and closer to zero, in fact. Uh, what is important is in this graph is that you have a strong dependence on the mean stress. As soon as you have void in your material, you will have a dependence of your yield criterion on the mean stress, so the hydrostatic component of the stress tensor. Okay, so now we can uh, have a look and try to do some improvements because uh, we did we, we derive this yield criterion just for uh, like a cylindrical uh, case, which is not very realistic. So what can we do to have a uh, a more general uh, yield criteria. So the first thing that we can do is to, we have a, a, like a strange dependence in, your, in the hyperbolic cosine uh, uh, between uh, the difference between mean stress and equivalent um, stress. Uh, and this is in fact due to the geometry that we consider. So we will uh, simply remove one of the equivalent uh, stress inside the hyperbolic cosine, first thing. Uh, second thing is that we will add some phenomenological parameters because there's no way that this model will work for very or like random realistic geometries. So we will need uh, at the end to, to, to put some parameters. And how to put these parameters? Uh, we can consider two extreme cases. So the first one is that uh, if the mean stress is equal to zero, we can have this definition of the equivalent stress, which will be sigma zero times one minus f. And we will say, OK, we will do 1 minus Q1 times F. So it's OK, because if F goes to 0, we just have sigma 0, which is OK. But we will have uh, like uh, parameters that we can calibrate. This is the first uh, parameter. And the, se the, the second extreme case is that we consider uh, the equivalent sun measure stress is equal to 0. So this time, the mean stress has this expression. And we will add here another parameter that we can calibrate based on experiments or numerical simulation. And so if we do that, we end up with what is known as the gerson fergard needleman yield criterion for porous isotropic materials. And this is, uh, so it was derived in the 70s, 80s, and it is still, still the, the most wide, widely used uh, model for ductile fracture. And it's, it's not so, it's not so complicated, but now we will need to ask the question, uh, is it in good agreement with numerical simulation? Because up to now, it was just like an analytical uh, solution with very uh, strong assumptions. So we need to, to compare to something, to, sa to some uh, reference uh, simulations. So the reference simulation is to, uh, let's take a cubic unit cell with a spherical void. Uh, let's apply an axisymmetric loading condition with a fixed geometry, so small strain settings, because we just want to assess the yield criterion and not finite strain evolution. Uh, and we'll consider also, also a fond measures plasticity with a perfect plasticity, no hardening. So you do this simulation and you compute the stresses at which you will have a plastic flow. So here you have a comparison between these numerical results. Uh, so these are the red dots. Uh, for different porosity um, compared to the GTN model. And in fact, it's very good if you, after calibration of the Q1 and Q2 parameters. Uh, it's good for, for large between 1 and, and, and before and 10% porosity in your unit set. So it's quite okay. So uh, just to mention that, uh, in fact, some here we we, we started from uh, like a cylindrical case where we can uh, compute uh, anything, but you have also some rigorous methods that have been developed to obtain uh, 
Yale Criterium, uh, one method per, per decade. So in the 70s, it was like uh, a method called limit analysis, uh, which was done by Gerson. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Rousselier proposed to use uh, thermodynamics, uh, basically using first and second law of thermodynamics to derive the Yale Criterium. And in the 19s, uh, nonlinear variational homogenization, like uh, as done by Ponte Castagna. So you have different uh, way to go to the top. Uh, and if we, we look at the, the difference between the models uh, derived by the different uh, framework, uh, this is this graph. Well, uh, there are some qualitative differences between the, the different approaches. Uh, but once you do some calibration of the parameters, it's quite very close at the end. So you don't have to be uh, like dogmatic to choose one model. Uh, instead of enough, just just compare to some reference simulation and, and go on. So we have a yield criterion. So now we, we need some evolution laws uh, for both plastic strain and porosity. So as we already saw, a plastic strain at the macroscopic scale is obtained from normality. So this is the same equation that we are using for a local fond mises plasticity. So this is simple. And we need also an, evolu uh, an evolution law for the porosity. And this, we can get it uh, just by simple arguments based on volume conservation. So the, the definition of a porosity is simply the, the void volume divided by the total volume of your unit cell. So you can take the, the derivative of this and then make use of two uh, assumptions. The first one is to say that uh, the, the variation of the void volume will be equal to the variation of the total volume of your unit cell. And this is to make the assumption that uh, the material, the matrix, is incompressible. So you just neglect elasticity. And also, you can relate the variation of the total volume divided by the total volume to the trace of the strain rate uh, macroscopic tensor, also neglecting elasticity. So you, we have, at the end, a very simple evolution law for the porosity. And now we can put uh, everything together. Um, we have a complete set of equations to extend von Mises plasticity to porous materials. So we have a yield criterion, we have a flow rule, we have a porosity evolution uh, law. And so we can solve uh, these equations uh, for uh, any kind of loading condition. So here this is for axisymmetric loading, loading condition. Uh, we can have a look at the first graph on the left here. So these are different uh, evolution of the stress as a function of strain for different initial porosity. There's a mistake here, this is 1%, and different ratio of, uh, of this parameter, alpha. Uh, basically, what you can see is first, uh, the yield stress will depend on the initial porosity, and it will also depend on this parameter, alpha. And uh, what is important to see is the, the softening uh, that we are able to get with such kind of model. And this something soft, softening is related to the evolution of a void volume fraction. Uh, so you can see on the other graph. So this is the evolution of porosity as a function of the applied uh, strain. Uh, and so you have a strong evolution of porosity that explain uh, basically uh, the softening behavior. Okay. So we have almost everything we need to do some simulation of in the growth regime. But what about coalescence? Uh, the GTN model, in fact, is, is relevant in the growth regime where, where you have no interaction between voids. So because the, what you will get with the GTN model is like three actual straining condition. But in the coalescence regime, in fact, you have just uniaxial straining conditions. So, so that's a different model. But we can go back to our uh, analytical solution to end up very easily uh, with a new uh, yield criterion, which will be relevant for coalescence. So the basic idea is to say, OK, in the unit cell simulation, uh, what we saw is that at coalescence, we have just uniaxial straining condition. And uniaxial straining condition is to say dxx of a dzz is equal to 0. Uh, and if we use this equation, we have um, a value for the parameter t that we have in our parametric equations for the macroscopic stresses. And if we put this value of a parameter t uh, in these two expressions in the middle, we, we will end up with a new uh, yielding condition, this time which will be relevant for coalescence. Uh, 
And this time, this is a little bit different from the TTN model because it, it involves only the actual uh, stress component sigma ZZ. And it depends also on the void volume fraction. So as for the GTN model, we can, uh, we can put this expression a little bit different, making use of the mean stress and equivalent von Mises stress uh, to end up with uh, the first expression of, in, of this slide. And again, as for the GTN model, we will try to make some improvements of this yield criteria. Uh, the first one is to say, okay, in coalescence, in fact, everything will happen in between two voids. So it will be uh, very localized behavior. So what will be relevant is not the global porosity, because we don't care uh, of what happened uh, below and, uh, and above the voids. Uh, what, what is important is the intervoid length. So it's the ratio A over B and not directly the porosity. So I will introduce a new parameter, which is chi that I will use. And again, we can also add some parameter, uh, like phenomenological parameter to account for different geometries with uh, like uh, a parameter Q, chi. Yeah. And so we end up with this kind of expression for the yield criterion relevant for coalescence. Uh, again, you can, you can find some rigorous derivation in, uh, in these two papers. So in the, the first paper on the subject, which is by Thomason, and more recent contribution by Van Zergeil. So is it working? Uh, is that good when we compare to uh, numerical evaluation on cubic unit cell uh, with uh, some like elongated voids? So this is the same kind of simulation as uh, we did for the G to, to assess the GTN model. We, we compare this expression to um, what we can get from uh, this simulation. And in fact, it, it's really good because here you have uh, the numerical uh, results, uh, the red dots, and the line is the model, and it works very well. So the, this expression is, is OK. Again, uh, now we have another complete set of equations uh, to extend von Mises plasticity. Uh, we have a yield criterion, we have a flow rule, we have a positive evolution. And so we can solve this equation for axis unit loading condition. Uh, just to mention that in coalescence, the evolution of porosity will be very huge compared to, to like the GTN model. And you will, you, will have, you will get a very strong softening behavior when you look at the, the evolution of stress as a function of strain, as you can see on these two, on these two plots. OK, but now we have two different uh, yield criterion. And uh, one may be active at the beginning, and uh, coalescence, so growth will be active at the beginning when the porosity is small, and coalescence will be active at the end. So we need to combine uh, these two, uh, these two yield criteria. So basically, that's what we are doing here. We have, we have two, these two expressions. We can, took, we can take the maximum of these two uh, uh, yield function to get a combined yield criteria. So on the left, you have just the GTN model. And on the right, you have the combined, so GTN plus coalescence. So coalescence corresponds to the straight line. And as you can see, uh, it leads to a better agreement for very large porosity and very large uh, mean stress. And it's better to do that in that part than using the GTN model. OK, so one last thing that we, we have to do uh, is how to model. So up to now, we did just look at perfect plasticity for the material uh, close to the void. Uh, but we need to model strain hardening of the matrix material around the void. So uh, you have some refined theoretical analysis. You can look at Leblon uh, recently to do that. But there is a simpler way, which is uh, from energy balance. And it was also in the paper by Gerson in the 70s. Uh, and basically, the idea is to say the macroscopic dissipation should be equal to local average dissipation. So here you have the, the, the calculus uh, to end up with an equation. So on the left, you have a macroscopic dissipation, so plastic uh, dissipation. And on the other side, you have local dissipation. So on the third line, the, the just the hypothesis is to introduce some uh, local average local plastic strain, which will I call P bar. Uh, this is like the, 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 the average uh, level of plastic strain uh, 
in the unit cell, let's say. And if you do that, you can, uh, you can continue your calculation and end, end up with this expression uh, th that is used to model strain hardening of porous material. So as you can see, a very simple expression, you have uh, just another additional state variable, which is this P bar, uh, and you will use the yield stress that will depend on P bar in your yield quite time. Okay, so now we have a full set of consecutive equations for porous materials. We have different unknown and different associated equations. So we have plus elastic, now we can put uh, again um, elastic strain, uh, elasticity. So if we, if we add again uh, elastic strain, the associated equation will be uh, the, the additive split of uh, elastic and, and plastic strain that will be equal to a total strain. Uh, we have plastic flow wall, uh, we have a yield criterion, we have a porosity evolution, and we have the equation for strain hardening. So we do have everything, and we can again solve these equations uh, for axisymmetric loading condition, but this time we can do not just for yielding, but for finite strain uh, evolution. So on the two graphs, you can see uh, the, uh, so the, this model compared to unit cell uh, simulation with finite strain settings. So you have void evolution and deformation of, of your unit cell. Uh, and you have a quite a good agreement. And uh, what you can see is that the, the sudden increase of softening is due to coalescence. So at some point you will start to, to use the coalescence criterion and you will have a strong softening behavior. That is well modeled. Uh, Okay, so, so at the beginning, we, we talked about some dimensionless parameters to describe pole metal alloys. So all models that you will find in the literature will account for porosity, so the parameter F, so the Gerson model and all its extension. And uh, you will find many, many, many extensions to account for the other things. So to account, for example, for different loading condition, like if you have more shear uh, loading condition, if you have not spherical voids, but more complicated void shape, like ellipsoidal or spheroidal. Uh, void distribution is, is a subset of coalescence, but it starts from Thomason. And also people develop model including void size and uh, accounting for matrix anisotropy. So if you are more interested, uh, you can have a look at these uh, four papers, review papers on ductile fracture that will detail uh, all these uh, models that you can, uh, that will extend the Gerson model. So I think I have, okay. Uh, I will go quickly on this, um, just to, to show you how to extend the GTN model to something more complicated in a very simple way. So uh, in the GTN model, you assume that the matrix material is just isotropic plasticity. But in, in some cases, if we, you are looking at porous metals, the voids will be very small. And in fact, the voids will be inside uh, grains, so inside single crystals. And if we are looking at a unit cell simulation of a void inside a single crystal, we can have a look at the movie, uh, it's a little bit different from the isotopic version because you will have a, um, a deformation mechanism that will depend on the crystallography. So the idea is to say, okay, how can we go from the GTN? So before, uh, if you are looking at power single crystal, you have a very strong effect of a crystallographic orientation on void shape evolution, but also on macroscopic strain, strain curve. Here you can have a look at the evolution of stress as a function of strain for different uh, crystallographic orientation for power uh, single crystals. So how to extend the GTN model to account for power single crystal in a very simple way? Um, the first thing to say is that uh, without void, von Mises plasticity is not a good uh, model uh, for, for single crystal uh, because we need some kind of crystal plasticity that will depend on the slip systems uh, of uh, a single crystal. Uh, you have two, you have a different yield criterion for um, crystal plasticity. Uh, you have like a physically based that will be related to the shear stress in each slip system. And here I will use an approximate yield criterion, which is like a regularized version of uh, the physically based. And if we do that, say, okay, let's start from the GTN model. 
and say what will be different if we now consider uh, porosity in a single crystal. Well, if porosity is equal to zero, I should end up with uh, like this regularized crystal plasticity model. So I will just change the first term and keep everything the same uh, at the end. And if I do that, um, we can have a look at is it good or not. And that was done in by, the, for example, the work of Poe. And it's, it's in fact very good because you have very good agreement between numerical evaluation and uh, and your and the model. It was just to show you quickly uh, how to go from one model to another, and it's it may not be so complicated at the end. And also many models that you will find in the literature for porous material will be very close to such kind of expression. Uh, the prefactors will change because of the uh, of the parameters that you want to consider. So to finish, uh, just to show you, so now we have some porous uh, constitutive equation that will account for the presence of voids. So you can use these constitutive equations to perform a simulation of total fracture uh, because uh, with these constitutive equations, the stresses will go to zero as porosity increases. So your, if you do finite element, your finite element will be completely uh, soft. And you can also, uh, at the end, remove these very soft finite elements that do not contrib contribute uh, to the mechanical equilibrium. So here we can have a look at uh, a simulation. So this is a, uh, a use of a GTN model with on a, so the geometry is just a notch, and you will they will pull on the notch, and we will, you will see at the beginning you have plasticity, and after you will have uh, breaking because the porosity will will increase in the finite element. So this is like a heavy simulation. So to conclude, um, I present you some models for ductile fractures through void growth to coalescence uh, with a micro-mechanical approach, uh, which is to say, let's do homogenization of a simplified unit cell to, to derive a yield criterion, validation by comparisons to reference porous unit cell results, and adding evolution laws uh, for the microscopic variables. Uh, you can find some other frameworks to, to do that, uh, like damage mechanics, when you will have a variable that will represent damage that may not be related to the local uh, local uh, deformation mechanism. And just to, to mention at the end that these models are simply constitutive equations, so basically uh, an extension of a von Mises plasticity, and you can use them in finite element simulation uh, because the stress softening will represent local ductile fracture. Uh, but this, uh, using this uh, constitutive equation in finite element simulation is a, a topic on its own because you need to have like an efficient implementation of these constitutive equations and this is not so easy. And you need also at some point, if you want, to, do, uh, to, to try to, to do efficient finite element simulation uh, because you will have some topics like mesh dependency, you may need to regularize your, your finite element uh, simulation, and that will be a link with the presentation that you will see this afternoon about non-local model that you may need to, to, to use uh, to, to use this model of doctoral factor in finite element simulation.